go. Hi. Take two. Uh, let's see. What did we miss? Uh, everybody, we everybody's been in, uh, overseas. We had we mentioned the crunchies. We mentioned that Mike Arrington is very large and tall, uh, as far as we can tell from the from the audience. <clears throat> And uh, and Robert, you were talking about. Oh, I don't know. I uh, but you know, this week BlackBerry came out with a new phone. Um, I was at the music conference, is where I was, uh, Madame Music Conference, and I was talking with a bunch of startups over there and judging startups and and meeting some of the guys who were doing a hackathon over there and and um, all pretty good. Uh, you know, th- nothing surprising, nothing shocking that I. I feel compelled to tell Gilmore gang about that we didn't already know, but, uh, the okay, well, that- what's shocking and compelling about what's going on, uh, regardless of location. Well, uh, uh, on the way back, I, I was sitting next to the guy who writes, uh, who runs the team, the smart labels team at Gmail, um, which also does priority inbox and does. And I think their team is heavily involved in the spam filter as well. Um, and we talked a lot about how those filters work and where they could be used in the future, particularly on social networks. And uh, I find his thinking very, very fascinating and his comparisons of other inbox tools like other inbox and sane inbox, which I'm using to be good. Uh, I learned a lot about how these filters work. And I, I don't think very many people know that, you know, when you drag something into the spam folder, it actually helps other people. It removes, it could remove that thing from other people's inboxes. And, um, and the smart labels work the same way. So smart labels, when you turn it on, it's a labs feature. So you have to go to settings and labs and Gmail and turn on this thing called smart labels. And it then adds a couple folders to your Gmail. So it adds promoted items and uh, let me just look to be accurate. Hold right, on a second. Well, uh, while you're looking for that, uh, also yeah. on the show today uh, yeah. from uh, Great Britain, Keith Tier and Kevin Marks. Hey, nice to be there. And um, I don't really want to talk about Google filters. I think it's too boring. Let's talk about. <laughs> yeah, but I want, I want to hear him. Let's talk mobile, about the uh, background behind the your US. screen. And that Did was John Tajek uh, also uh, joining us from I, uh, his uh, state of mind. Keith, would you rather talk about the the new BlackBerry 10? You know, I, I kind of found one thing interesting about that, which is they've integrated wait a minute, direct, wait a minute. Excuse direct me. Uh, messaging from Twitter and messages from Facebook into the universal inbox they've got. I want on the face of it, it looks kind of interesting. Okay, we'll get back to that after Scoble finishes what he was talking about, because uh, if we don't let him finish, then he'll talk about it for the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead, Robert. No, I, I just say I, I found it interesting. I think noise filters are, are going to be hugely important in the future, and we've talked about them. It's just, um, eh, I don't know. It okay, well, how, how, does, how do you drag something out of your uh, inbox and having to uh, drag out of mine? I don't understand what that means. Well, if I mark something as a promoted uh, item, for instance, if I get a, a, an email it's from crowdsourcing. Uh, it's crowdsourced noise filtering. So if I add a fab email to the promoted folder, it uh, adds a little vote, and it could take that same item out of your inbox and put it in the promoted folder. And certainly if the three of us all mark the same email as a promoted item, then it really uh, becomes a rule um, that that gets used everywhere. And that's so this why these promoted, promoted folder or whatever it is, this... Uh, yeah, filter th- is uh, how do I do I have to opt into it is what I'm asking yeah yeah so it's a these new filters are uh, well first but of all you already spam. have spam is a normal filter spam is a filter that's already built in so already if you just move things into the spam folder it votes for that as spam and could add that to spam for the uh, other users on the system certainly if all if everybody marks that item as spam it becomes a rule um, so we're going to so see this new. There's uh, a whole. Uh, there's a whole market for this. This is where the uh, yeah. the uh, spam houses come in, and they uh, start uh, documenting what's spam and what's not. 
And you basically have to pay the cartel, the spam houses, to whitelist your domains if too many people mark your domain as That's a That's insane. So in other as words, a, as a spam. So um, you, it's like an uh, industry. Address. It's like SEO for email. I missed that because I was talking. It was like it's like SEO for email. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So you know, there's it. So if you turn this thing on, it's in the labs feature inside Gmail settings. So you got to go settings labs, and then um, uh, turn on the smart labels feature, which is there's a long list of cool things you can turn on in labs. Um, it adds a uh, forms. Uh, folder, uh, a notifications folder, uh, a promotions folder, and a social updates folder. So, for instance, a lot of people get all these things from Facebook or Twitter into their inbox, which clutters up their inbox and keeps them from seeing normal email from from their real friends. When you turn this thing on, it puts all that all that bacon. I I call this stuff bacon. Puts that those messages into the social updates folder and cleans out your inbox. And just a minute, just a minute. Did Robert use just say mail too? that Facebook and Twitter clutter up your inbox where you're getting email from your real friends? That's a deep right. statement. That, that, there's a lot of implications in what you just said. Right. And yeah. Ca I, it's called bacon I follow, mail. I follow a lot of people on Facebook and Twitter. I follow 37,000 people on Twitter, so there's no way I'm going to get notifications that are useful <laughs> from Twitter. <laughs> but Facebook, I have 40, 4,800 friends on Facebook. They're not real-world friends. They're not business partners, they're not uh, co-workers, and they're not uh, people like Keith Tier that if he invited me to uh, have a beer tonight, I might take him up on it. <laughs> Robert, come and have a beer. Well, I'm, I'm busy wine. tonight, I'm actually. Wine, but... Okay, now I understand. I understand uh, what you were talking about before. Uh, what did I interrupt you about, Keith? What are the you? Blackberry Sorry, 10. I didn't hear the question because there was Blackberry a noise here and you cut out. Blackberry 10. Uh, BlackBerry 10, yeah, the only thing that's interesting to me is, um, well, firstly, you know, they've been pretty thoughtful about the, the OS, which is, given that they're losing and likely to keep losing, uh, someone uh, is still being creative, because they came up with a nice UI, and in particular, the unified inbox, which cuts out all the noise from Facebook and Twitter, but it does let DMs through on Twitter, and it lets messages through from Facebook to give you a single place to reply to stuff. And I don't know about you, but I hate going to Facebook to reply to a message that's been sitting there for four days because I, I don't use Facebook for messaging. So anyone who messages me there isn't going to get in front of me. I hate that. And sometimes the messages are important, and I do want to reply to them. So bringing them into the inbox is smart. And DMs are the same. I mean, I don't think I've ever had a DM from someone I didn't know. It's always a welcome message. Uh, but it happens in another environment. So I think that it's pretty smart of BlackBerry to integrate those three things together. With email and SMS, you've got all four in a single integrated inbox. That, uh, no one else has really done that. Well, ThreadZ tried to. Uh, there, there have been a couple attempts at these unified inboxes. Uh, it does look good on the surface. That's yeah. the kind of feature, though, that I need. You didn't a bit. mean that, the brand name. No, I, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It looks good uh, superficially. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> superficially, um, sales are way down, by the way. Well, uh, on the surface. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's also true. <laughs> uh, BlackBerry 10 uh, is actually lo looks pretty good. Uh, you know, I had it in my hands for 20 minutes, and it, on on superficially in a 20 minute preview, it looks really nice. With the exception of app app availability and app quality, uh, this is still going to be a huge problem. And I know they're working hard on it. And they 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 don't like talking about it, but the reason I buy these ecosystems now is apps and and the depth of of what's available for the ecosystem. Is it uh, built on uh, QNX? Yes. So the so the OS and the the fit and finish. If if Apple brought this product out. Six years ago, you would have been mad. That's cool, <laughs> right? Um, it the fit, fit fit and finish feels like an Apple device. It feels top end. It uh, the speed of it feels top end. It doesn't have the janky uh, problems that a lot of Android had, you know, in the early days. Um, 
Do, do you the think only, they should have built that on I Android? Grab, the only or, thing negative I mean, because QNX, the, who's going to support it? Who's going to write to it? Well, and that's the problem. It, and that's why, they're, by the way, they're running really hard toward HTML5 because they're trying to get app developers. If they go HTML5, then their app, apps will work on, on QNX just fine. Um, you know, if you're going to build a, an iOS app, you're uh, going to lock out the uh, other other ecosystems. Um, uh, and I, I can I can tell you what what we're doing is probably what everyone's going to do, is yeah. we're building native apps for Android and iOS, and then we're building an HTML5 version of Just on Me for other people. But the HTML5 version is nowhere near as good as the native versions. It, it's even has less features, but also performance isn't as good. So we're gonna people on BlackBerry and Windows Phone are gonna end up with second best. Yeah, it's interesting since my rant last week about how Apple is, uh, you know, under pressure at minimum from the from the Android yes, system. Yes, the D fanboyization of Robert Scoble. Yeah, that's why. That's why the I clock is my, ticking, Robert. By the way, that's why I wear my Apple fanboy shirt. Oh, my API fanboy that somebody crossed out. Apple. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I had a, a developer uh, yesterday who is building a new video app, and he said that uh, Apple has hardware video acceleration, which Android does not have, and his app is actually impossible to build on Android, he claims. It's a new app called Gibbet, which will let you do video editing on the iPhone. And so, you know, th there's there are some things that Apple does natively for app developers and always has that the other ecosystems don't do and that that is going to be a tough thing to overcome yeah you know but, 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 but that's, that's six to one uh, acceleration one at a time one at a time acceleration yeah, yeah, it's all going to be built four at a time. Qualcomm, ti that'll be a that'll be a standard feature for everything all right so uh, i didn't hear the first part of what you said or the last part of what uh, keith said because you were talking at the same time so Keith, go first. So I, I was saying that uh, I'm, I'm totally an Apple fanboy, whether I'm wearing my Just Me developer hat or whether I'm wearing my consumer hat. But I will say that the other side of what you just said, Robert, is that Android does let you do a lot of things Apple doesn't, in, yep. including things like looking at the you know, a person's email with their permission or their call history with their permission. Uh, so that you can do intelligent things for them with that data, uh, and yeah. Apple doesn't. So it's kind of six of one and half a dozen of the other from a developer point of view. Okay, John, what did you say? Oh, I just said uh, it was more to the point about uh, acceleration. I mean, that's just a that's a, a common thing that's going to be part of every uh, Snapdragon or um, you know a TI processor, OMAP processor. It's all going to be built in. It's just the you know it's just the trend toward it. Right, I, I but, don't think that's but, a that's a future. I know, but but let's say Qualcomm comes up with acceleration. That means that the Android ecosystem only has that feature for the new phones. It doesn't have it for backward compatibility. This this developer said that video acceleration is in all phones all the way back to the 3GS. Mm. Well, my, so, Microsoft's been playing this game, uh, and in fact, they continue to of, you know, baking in acceleration as a reason to stay on uh, IE or whatever. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be working very much anymore. Uh, the question is, is whether it does work for Apple since they're the leader at this point. Yeah, that, and on Keith's point, um, that's why I went off last week because there are. Uh, broad range of new apps, I call them contextual apps, that use uh, the dialer and the calendar and the contact system and the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radios that Apple does not let them have access to. So uh, it is interesting, but but you, you, even with all both of those ecosystems, they all do things that the BlackBerry has not come up with and said, our ecosystem does X, Y, and Z that the other ones don't. And that's that's uh, uh, going to be a hard thing for them to deal with. Kevin Marks, your comment, please. My comment on which bit? Sorry. Uh, anything, just like where your <laughs> your mouth moves, and I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, like I just reiterate my usual is that 
Um, you need to, do, as Keith says, you need to do you need to do the HTML5 stuff. You need to do the native stuff to some extent. Um, but if you're going to drop either, you drop the native one. You drop the native one. Yeah, you can ship an HTML5 only product. Um, I believe more than you can ship an native only product. Well, well, it's certainly true that if you choose to go native, uh, you can only do two, maybe even only one platform. But you certainly can't do more than two because yeah. it's also proprietary that you have to have different engineering teams. Even the skills are different. You know, Java guys can write Android, and Objective C guys can write iOS. I'm not even sure what you need to know to write BlackBerry or Windows, probably .NET for Windows, uh, mobile, and and a startup can't afford to that development effort. So in that sense, I think you're right, Kevin. But if you want to be successful in the market, I think you have to go native because consumers want native, and and the performance is better anyway. But even if it wasn't, um, the whole app store experience on both Google and iPhone seems to trump the open web experience from a consumption point of view. And I, I saw Mary Mika last uh, month said that uh, the hours people spend on apps now is greater than the hours they spend on HTML on the web, on the browser, which seems to be just indicative of uh, where the market's at. Well, that kind um, of says it, it all, doesn't it? But if you it? subtract out gaming, is that still true? I mean, that's the... Yeah. yeah. It, depends, it, it depends a lot what you're making. So, yes, for gaming, you want to go native, you need to be close to the metal. They've just released, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, OpenGL for, for Android. You can just about do it in the browser now. It's not certainly not ready to build anything serious in. So if you're doing a game, you, you have to go native. I, I question that for many other things that are primarily, you know, textual or, or visual in nature, the, the, whether, you, whether you need that. Well, well I, think it's, I don't think it's like either scrolling. or. scrolling. Uh, I don't think... Just look at the scrolling performance for images... HTML5 versus, if you guys go to beta.just.me, you're going to see an HTML5 scrolling images in the public stream. It's live right now. And compare that to the just.me app, which you can download now. It's just.me slash get the app uh, slash. Um, you, you just look at the scrolling performance on each. It's not even close. And that that is using uh, hardware acceleration in the native, and it doesn't it isn't made available to you in the HTML5. But well, the same thing was true when Windows came out, or Windows apps versus HTML apps. I mean, HTML was slower, and uh, particularly when when they started, when developers started adding Flash into uh, into the websites, it became very slow. And there was that eight second rule if your web page didn't open. Meanwhile, an app, you know, would would automatically be faster. But the uh, pervasiveness of of the web or HTML. You know, certainly uh, out outdrew the number of apps, and it's the parallel continues because you could say that well, n none of the HTML uh, vendors made tons of money versus the app companies who made a lot more, but still HTML survived and uh, was necessary, Pro and it's still necessary. Yeah, of course yeah. it is. I mean, it's not an either or situation; uh, they're complementary to each other. Uh, I I don't agree with Kevin's comment that uh, you drop native. You, well, I think you're never going to drop. Uh, I'm not saying drop native. I'm saying if you've got to, if you're just going to do if one, you don't do native. That's why. Uh, I so Kevin, that's that's really a great unless you're trying to do a video editing app and then of you course, have no I'm choice. Of course, trying to do a video editing app. I'm saying, yeah. oh, everything has to be native is is bullshit because a big chunk of things are actually just straightforward textual presentation with structure and a bit there of There would be no native if uh, Apple hadn't opened up HTML uh, for development on the iPhone yeah. first. I mean, it's, they're not uh, mutually exclusive. It's not a zero-sum game. It is a zero-sum game once you get past native for, uh, for you know, the sexiness of it and the ability for uh, things that are increasingly going to be important, like push notification. You know, the things that hang off the container are uh, going to define the next generation of software, uh, if they haven't already. And the combination of that and HTML5 for speed, for ubiquity across platforms, for allowing companies to not have to make financial bets that ruin them because they don't put enough resources into native. Yeah, and I think that you know, we're, did you we're see skewing Tim the conversation toward hang on a second. Uh, and, uh, Keith, and startups. Stop. Thanks. Go ahead, John. From the beginning or just where yeah, I Yeah, from the beginning. It's, it's We're skewing the conversation toward ISVs. 
and startups, which is kind of the, uh, the focus, particularly with, uh, with Keith. But if you're a company and you have to make a bet on, on some, some technology, I would agree with Kevin. You, you should go with uh, HTML5 because you don't know what, you know what size of device you're going to scale to, whether you want to write it once and have, uh, um, and, and have it uh, run on your uh, desktop and you know, all sorts of things that you, you can uh, build in, um, you know, lack of obsolescence, you know, you built in some kind of uh, evolutionary path that you can do, rather than pick a platform and then have people come in with different devices that you can't support, right? So a company, if they had to drop something, I would drop the native. I mean, they're, they're resource constrained. Well, um, I disagree. I think that... Uh that you drop native at your peril. Uh, uh, you you stage HTML. Uh, you don't rely on it. If you rely on it, I mean, for example, and I I don't want to lose what uh, uh, Keith you were saying uh, when John was talking. So if you can hold that thought, whatever it was. Um, uh, I the other day I was on Facebook on the web. I don't don't ask me why. Tina already asked me why. I have no idea why I was on H T uh, Facebook on the web, but on some the on the iPad, of course. I, that's all the only thing I'm ever on is the iPad. And uh, somebody pinged me, uh, uh, somebody who I know from the chat room here, I believe. I I forget who it was uh, on Facebook chat, and the experience was extraordinarily effective. Now this is HTML5, but somehow they've figured out how to be able to do this. Uh, you know, uh, they haven't been able to previously. You were, I was able to have a continuous conversation with somebody um, who, uh, you know, in in real time, back and forth with chat messaging, and the window uh, resizing of the little chat window was was good. I mean, it was just extraordinarily well done. So. You know, obviously, HTML5, uh, Facebook, there's all this noise about how they went back to uh, uh, to native in order to solve problems that they were having with the uh, HTML5 experience, but uh, they didn't throw away the work. In fact, I think that the work is proceeding simultaneously in both platforms. I think that was a little bit of misdirection and uh, wave of the hand, slide of the hand, anyway. Um, but well, I, you know, the other thing about HTML5 well, is a lot of these standards then? bodies, they sit around and don't do anything. Um, Kevin might agree or disagree with this, but uh, well, they gone. don't seem to really uh, I'm, focus I'm, I'm on here. a problem I mean, this, or this a task. Kind of right? Turn your video they, back They on. focus on a general uh, concept. And the iPhone and that marketplace around it and, and, the, and the use of apps has actually inspired better HTML5 um, uh, technology that comes out and more more innovation around the, the standard. Well, that that was the waving of the hands that w was that point. So I'm not sure what you meant by waving the hands. By you know, in other words, are you complaining? Well, I don't I think they completely yeah. did HTML5. I think they did a they did a, a combination of a few things, and they probably just wanted to do something different. I don't. I mean, I think he's just waving off the mobile at the time. Was it when Zuckerberg said this? I think he was waving off the mobile ad revenue um, questions and just said, hey, look, we sucked in mobile. Now now look at us go. Okay, you know? fair and enough. I, when I, Robert when called I, a sandbaggy before. I, when I, I, I think, you know, we're talking about multiple things at the same time here. And I mean, if you separate them out, one, one question that Kevin really is saying is, uh, we should want HTML5 to work because uh, if, we, if it doesn't, we lose a lot of things that we gained with HTML. And I think that's absolutely correct that uh, linkage and the ability to traverse the web and uh, discover and refer um, is all part of HTML. But but that happens at a time when consumers are moving from desktop and laptop to mobile devices that perform better with native apps. Uh, and the way that most native apps deal with that is they build HTML browsers inside the app. So so you click well, they, on a link well, they do on in the Twitter app, you get you, you can link and you can get to the HTML, but it's done through through an app. So I don't think you necessarily lose anything in terms of the gains of HTML by moving to an app world, as long as the apps are open and let you link and open browser windows 
whether inside the app or outside the app, you, you kind of gain things. Tim Berners-Lee made a point today, which is kind of in this world, which he said, um, if you don't get root access to your device, then you're the slave of the vendor, not an independent actor. And, and that, oh, please. Seen, you know, this whole thing about openness, the desire for openness, which both HTML and root access speak to, in a world which is becoming increasingly owned, uh, you know, Apple owns iOS, Google owns Android, Facebook owns Facebook and is increasingly closing down its platform to external access. Um, uh, Twitter's doing the same. So it seems like we're moving to these fiefdoms uh, that are all in some way or another walled or owned. And we all have this desire to work across all these platforms in an open way. And, you know, that's the, that's the era we're in. Um, and, you know, it's going to be a while until we get through the other end to a more open world. It's almost like Windows 3.1, which predated HTML and was an app world and locked in. Then we got HTML, and now we're back to this kind of app-centric, locked-in, multiple places to be locked-in world. Um, uh, and, and getting a path through that is going to take a while. Well, uh, I guess everybody on the show agrees with that except me. Huh? Well, you agree with what he just said, right? No, no, we're not not fully. I mean, I think the you know we've got these these countervailing forces going on at the same time. We have got these various companies who are now trying to con you know construct um, walled gardens and places that keep things apart. But at the same time, we do have these um, efforts to build a uh, an open platform that are actually bearing serious fruit in HTML5. You know, the, the, when both you know Adobe and Microsoft are submitting to WebKit so that they're, so that um, HTML5 standard gets more uniform, that's 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 quite a change in the world, in my opinion. And that's you know that that's just become that way because that's the way people expect this this stuff to work now. Um, and the, you know the reason that uh, to, to to sort of dismiss web browsing on on the on the tablets and phones, I think, is a mistake. I think there there is a lot of that going on, and it's starting to displace web browsing on on desktops. By the way, I wasn't saying that I agree with that point of view, uh, Steve. I was trying to express that and understand where it comes from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else uh, completely agree with Tim Berners-Lee? I don't know all his stances. Uh, generally, I think he's right. I, um, I agree with Tim in general. Yeah. Um, he's. You know, there's the, 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 the sort of structural problem which he which he does address a little in that in that. Well, in the report I saw of the speech, I haven't seen the whole speech, is that once you have root access, um, there is a problem about running an application as if it were you um, and starting something up and then it running later on and how easy it is to do that. The, the, those kinds of um, root exploits can be very difficult and trying to sense what's this stuff is really, really hard. We've had you know a lot of that this week. We've had um, some, some huge um, Ruby on Rails exploits and how much you guys have caught up on that. But... Um, there was a, a bug found in um, parsing YAML in, in Rails that meant people could inject arbitrary code into Ruby on Rails servers. That was substantially patched. Um, that you know, was patched in the core of Rails, but everyone's got to go and patch all their Rails apps and update all the versions to do that. Um, and then this week, um, two days ago, um, the Ruby Gems site, which is the um, repository for all the little bits of plugins that plug into Ruby on Rails, um, was compromised by a similar exploit, and that had to be taken down and checked to make sure that hadn't nothing had actually been captured. And that that was, you know, like a, a massive fire drill for the um, for web hosting companies and for anyone building apps in that field. We've had similar things recently with with Java on on the desktop. The, the you know, it used to be that um, the core place to attack was Windows because that was the ubiquitous platform, and now we're seeing these much more diverse attacks because as Windows declines. Um, to have the which bugs you should ex exploit change, and that's that's a you know a, 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 that's the sort of worrying counterpoint to having root is that if you have root and you act and you run an app as root, then it can do whatever you can do, and therefore it can take over your machine and do bad things. And the challenge is is is, is the tension between these two is how you have a security model, a sandbox, or a capability-based security model that lets apps only do what you expect them to do, and how you explain what the apps allow to do to the user. So Tina's complaining that this is too nerdy in the chat room. 
<laughs> it's way nerdy. Um, yeah, but well, chat rooms you know, are there's nerdy. a way. There is a way for it to be less nerdy, which is talking. Uh, you look at Ubuntu's uh, OS for mobile and uh, Firefox's OS, which are kind of sideshows. But the real question is, are they relevant in some way? Do we think they're going to be relevant? I bet uh, it'd be interesting what Kevin and uh, uh, Robert think about that. Kevin, in particular. Um, well, the 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 Firefox one is is taking a huge bit on HTML. That that's basically it's a it's an it's an HTML platform for for um, for phones. Um, and you know we've had one of those. That's what um, Palm did. So you know you you can argue that that's that's didn't have great success there. Um, but it uh, but I, the way that Palm built it, it was oh well, you start with HTML and then you do a bunch of random stuff that only works on Palms. And if you look at it on anything else, it doesn't work. Um, I think Firefox have been smarter than that. They're building something that will actually run on that and run on other phones as well in the browsers. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of potential with that. Um, the other thing we're seeing, and people in the chat room mentioned this as well, that there are a lot of apps that people are building that are actually web apps wrapped up in um, PhoneGap, or whatever it's called now, Cordova, um, which takes a, a web app and wraps it into a native app and adds some uh, ability to access the native features that, that the browser doesn't yet deliver. Um, and that's, there's a, again, there's a raft of informational and useful apps that are being built that way um, that, that can then run across multiple different platforms and um, can be packaged as apps or as as websites. So we're starting to see some convergence between the two, and you know, th th there's always some sort of leakage around the edges of like, what's the, what's the right thing to do. But I think there was, um, you know, one of the one of the examples that always comes back to me was um, Foursquare. When Foursquare launched, it launched an iPhone app and a little website, a mobile website that you could use on any phone. That mobile website is still there. If you go to m.foursquare.com, you get this. Um, very stripped down HTML um, site that actually has all the features of, of Foursquare because they build a minimal implementation of the common back end and a minimal presentation. And they build a rich presentation um, on the phone for the, for the apps. And, you know, fair, and um, they just this week launched an app that is um, for people who are admitting businesses on Foursquare and want to do that. They've, they've launched a phone app on that that. that it is effectively an alternative UI to using the main desktop website for that. So that you know that that's a pointer to how how you know smart companies do this stuff, which is to have a back end API and then alternative user interfaces that are tuned for different purposes. And and you can tune that for a specific device and then say, go all the way and make a native one, or you can tune that by saying I'll have a you know a, a a hybrid app or a web only app that is tuned for Android or iOS. Okay, good. So that wasn't nerdy? I don't. <laughs> it wasn't nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was like so nerdy that it was actually uh, easy to understand. <laughs> you know, I, th I think for, for a developer, the key is to build, um, to build an API um, separation between your presentation layer and your back-end functionality, and to, to be able to build a a native app or an HTML app or uh, becomes just an implementation of your API, and and uh, you put most of the uh, most of the effort into the back end. Um, that that seems to be a fairly web to a way of thinking, and, and and it implies centralization of power. If you think of the way the web to was built, inevitably you had to build all the logic in the cloud. And the browser was just consuming it, and all browsers were clients to the same core. That centralization of logic works for a lot of things. But with iOS and with Android, you're starting to get edge based logic and intelligence running on the devices and just using the cloud as a kind of a glue between them. And, and that feels to me a decentralization of logic and power uh, with glue. And I, I don't know if the two. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you lose openness by moving to an app world in, in a narrow sense of the word openness, but you gain power and control on the device in the hands of the user, which is very attractive to the users. Yeah, I think so. that's exactly right. John Toshek, what do you think? I want to change the discussion. Go ahead. I think we beat this one up. Go ahead. 
I don't know what to change it to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, what did it start with? We see somehow started these hybrid the clients. How about that? Learn and then went to over to HTML5. <laughs> these hybrid clients contain uh, a little uh, chemical, which uh, keeps us from actually thinking about anything other than our phones. <laughs> yeah. um, well, at the Crunchies, what one? GitHub. Yep. That was exciting. See, that's interesting. It is, but it's why it's kind of wonky, and we'll just continue on the same thread. I know. Well, that, I well, I don't have a problem with it. It's Tina. Don't know what GitHub is probably <laughs> when I get when the show's over, I'm going to have a problem because Tina doesn't want it to be nerdy, but I do. I like what we're talking about here. I think it's interesting. You know, the most controversial decision at Crunchies was that Mark Zuckerberg was CEO of the year, and I, I had a gut feeling that Larry Page deserved that this year because I think he's. He's come from being um, an unlikely CEO to actually having done a pretty decent job, I think. Whereas Zuckerberg arguably drove the car off the edge of the cliff and is barely surviving, having gone IPO just at the I, point I when he was having to transition to mobile. Yeah. I don't think he dro drove the car off the cliff. I think the, the car uh, is extraordinary what he's done. I mean, you know, he drove the, the cliff into the car. Yeah, he did. I'm, I'm he did. talking about the IPO, though, Steve. I, I I understand, but you know, just because no. uh, Wall Street couldn't absorb, uh, you know, didn't come out. I mean, look at what Wall Street's doing with Apple's price right now. You know, they're all freaked out about this, but you know, Apple is the number one selling device uh, worldwide. That was just announced today. Uh, you know, the fundamentals of these companies. No, that's in the U.S. All right, well, fine. What else? I um, mean, there's yeah, our protector, yeah, no Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, you know, I think the stock market's up today and Facebook is down. And uh, ultimately, a CEO over time is going to be measured by the valuation of the company. But you have to give them all the credit for getting the valuation up to what it is. Exactly. So I, mean, I think it, he's doing it was, fine. It was real, it's and, real uh, money and, now. But I also think Larry's doing fine by taking the appropriate risks. Yeah, and, actually, uh, I wasn't and coming out with I, really interesting new technologies, and and also ones that are consumable. We sat yeah, I, next to I, some I guy with Google Glasses. I didn't Zuckerberg. I was just more making the point that Larry's done an awesome job, and arguably, between the two of them, that's the more more surprising fact. I I, I disagree. I think that uh, the more surprising fact is how uh, Facebook continues to be misread, and uh, I'd say the same thing is true about uh, Twitter. All the noise is about, about Twitter is that uh, somehow they haven't succeeded in figuring out how to be able to be uh, who, who they decided that they wanted to be, or, or whatever the well, question Twitter is. got a valuation today, right? Somebody, Ten billion. Uh, reported it, it was Ten billion? Yeah. Now, That's what's a that based big valuation. on? Yeah, it's huge. Well, the other interesting bit of news today is that Dell is probably being taken private by uh, Michael Dell's venture arm and Silver Lake. Which and Microsoft succeeded, too, right? begs the question whether taking it private is going to solve any of its problems. Well, they don't have to go under the scrutiny of the public. I mean, that's why companies go private. Um, yeah, but it also and, means taking away uh, And they can work on things in, uh, in a more risky fashion, I guess. But what would that be? Well, no, not really, because, you know, the thing is... It, if you take yourself private, you, you put on a great part of debt. So you can do risky things for a short while until your debt explodes. Right? You're, you're basically replacing equity with, 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 with debt. Yeah, uh, except it's going not, to be funded, not really propped up by way, the way maybe Microsoft, Silver um, Lake, and Dell's venture. Yeah, the, de the debt usually is a small enough percentage of the equity value that that isn't really a big deal. And the cash flow usually can pay the interest on the debt fairly easily. And the assumption is you can turn it around and as a public company two or three years from now like Seagate did, it'll be worth a lot more, you know, several times more than it's worth today. Um, uh, they're doing that with GoDaddy. GoDaddy is now owned <coughs> by Silver Lake and KKR and that's the, the play. So the real question for Dell is, well, what would the strategy be that would make it worth more than it is today? Well, I'm they're making see. really big inroads in education government. Uh, this is uh, traditional server sales, but also the consulting business that, uh, that they're internally doing is, uh, is getting a good credibility anyway, a good street cred. And so they could be turned turn themselves into a consulting company that makes hardware. 
Right. I what, think server side, yeah, I can get that in the cloud. Um, I think Windows 8 is a terrible thing for people like Dell because they've got to deal with the fact that consumers are not going to embrace it in large numbers or enthusiastically. So the consumer side is dead as long as Windows doesn't have a better version. Well, I don't know. I think that the Windows 8 uh, uh, forces uh, only a few companies can survive Windows 8. And 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 Dell would be one of the ones that, that can survive it um, because they'll be able to do some innovation around whatever the you know new touch devices are. Uh, you know, are we going to see more innovation from Dell on the consumer side or from something like uh, Samsung or uh, Lenovo? You know. Yeah, that's the few companies I, that Dell will have to contend with. I just um, don't see Dell being that innovative on consumer technology like tablets and mobile phones and you know whatever else comes next. But um, and, and look wearable what, computers or whatever. And look what Samsung is doing. Uh, you know, and they're not doing it on Windows. They're doing it on Android. Yeah, and they're planning on coming out with a well. They're they're supporting Tenzin, which is an operate, open source uh, mobile OS that they're going to start increasing the noise about over the next 18 months. Well, Dell had the problem of, of becoming uh, two things. One was they w went bigger into the enterprise and that was great. It was a good source of revenue. And the other um, mm -hmm. was kind of a, the, this consulting thing, whereas they had like pockets of innovation. And they, they really, their IP was around their supply chain, but that, it, that doesn't matter. If but the supply chain supply. now the the advantage of Dell's supply chain is what for uh, data centers. I mean, Rackspace uses a lot of Dell, and when I visit government, I see lots of Dell. And you know, when I went through the customs yesterday or two days ago, there was a lot of Dell, right? But I think that, they, that's they not a, innovative. A lot of that that's market, just, we use that? them. I know because they they their supply chain advantage is not innovative. It's low cost. They've they've stripped every penny out of the supply chain as possible, and that. That's why it's good for enterprise kinds of machines, right? Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the, those big honking machines, you know, those old, old style servers that, um, you know, that I don't think people are buying those in, in droves. I'm sure they still sell them. Um, but those don't lend themselves to Windows 8 at all. They but barely you lend can themselves tell, to Windows You can server tell this conversation anymore. is so boring, by the way, that the chat room is trying to get us back on to talking about the BlackBerry and well, not the, about the, Microsoft. The other, by the way, so the, <laughs> the other side of the Dell thing is that Amazon this week announced a new service for video transcoding in the cloud. Yep. And that's about their fourth new service in about two months. And, the, the, you know, the, the virtual cloud uh, service layer is becoming better and better and better. And I yep. think Amazon killed about three companies this week by announcing that. Well, that prices I don't are know so about low. killed. Uh, Red, Red Bull, for instance, does all of its video encoding on uh, Rackspace and, and a company called encoding.com. But yeah, that does uh, make, make their, uh, <laughs> it does make their uh, <laughs> survival harder. So I want to make a comment about the uh, boring quotient. Uh, I think that if you were to look back at this, which uh, uh, through the miracle of, uh, of compression we will be able to do, uh, we'll find that this, this show so far has been uh, full of a lot of uh, information that uh, I don't think you'll find uh, in one place anywhere else. So that's number one. Uh, so in other words, the signal to noise of the show has actually been pretty extraordinary, I think, because yeah. I've learned a whole lot about stuff that I know nothing about uh, in the last few minutes. Secondly, so, what is there to talk about about the BlackBerry? Is it going to, you know, is it a great <laughs> implementation? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, David Pogue was, you know, uh, prostrating himself at the uh, altar of Scoble apologies uh, for his position about this. But it doesn't mean at the end of the article, after you know two pages of New York Times about how cool the you know you can flick words up to the screen, uh, he says, well, "Is it going to make a difference? Probably not." Let's talk about that keyboard because that keyboard is actually pretty cool. That keyboard was developed by a third party, uh, was not developed by Rim, and that third party is developing a keyboard for Android uh, that will be out in a month. So the advantage of that keyboard 
is uh, going to be superseded by a keyboard on the Android within a month. And the is one this on, the hardware keyboard or the software? No, keyboard? no, it's a software. It's a it's a contextual keyboard, so it learns from your email and your Facebook and your the things you do, and it starts guessing at what you're typing. So when you type E X, what's that my, Android my, uh, app that uh, does that? Uh, uh, SwiftKey. 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 Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not SwiftKey though. It is. It is SwiftKey. Oh. Yeah, well, the, but, the Swift, but Swift Key has a new version. Uh, so out. it's already on Android. But the Swift it's Key well, on, it's, out, it's out in beta, yeah. The yeah I mean, I've, I've been using it. I, I, I I've seen something I'm not Domingo supposed to talk about. Saying, you know, try this out. I've seen something I'm not supposed to talk about from Swift Key coming out at the Mobile World Congress uh, at the end of February. And it, it's pretty mind blowing. It, uh, Is this within that, two minutes of me saying? typing, I'm 50% faster than on my iPhone. Demonstrably <clears throat> faster. And yeah. I. I this is one of my frustrations with the uh, Apple ecosystem that Apple doesn't let developers mess with the 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 uh, keyboard. So we are falling behind innovations on other platforms. Well, we who's uh, the we? Yeah, I don't anybody know who's... who's an Apple fan. Actually, on on Apple, and you user can... is falling behind. I I am going to be fifty percent <clears throat> less quick on typing. Uh, on my iPhone, as then the three people Android. who are doing this other thing. No, there's Worldwide. a lot more than three people. <laughs> there's a lot more than three people. Yeah, when it comes out on iPhone, the so number one app a on lot Android. Of people will be using it. It can't come out on iPhone because Apple won't let you. you can't I, come I, on, I was going to say you can't. They iPhone won't. Can't. Buys them. What? Yeah, they won't I let you. This is and, an um, open technology. And also swipe, and I interchange them because on Android I can pick, you know, four or five different input keyboards. Uh, and just change them, and it changes everything about them. You know, you could have. Yep. I mean, it's it's really a time saver. Uh, our daughter got laryngitis this week, and so she walked around with some speak application, and she was <laughs> talking to us. I mean, I don't think anybody on this call, including Scoble, can type as fast as she does on the iPhone. I'd like to race. I'll race her. It's it's with pretty. This new that, With this new keyboard, I will beat her on speed. No problem. By the we way, should I have a swipe versus swift, swift key. You can't uh, actually change you know, the keyboard on Apple. Head to head. Two, two <coughs> enter. Two keyboards I, I, enter, one leave. Well, the new swift key has, has the, the swipe stuff, um, swipe, style swiping oh, built well, in. Oh, then never mind. <laughs> but, but Google owns swipe, don't they? This, uh, uh, somebody bought Swipe. Somebody did buy Swipe. So that's that's another thing is I I predict at the Google I.O. show, when is that, in April, Kevin, or May? Uh, I'm not sure they announced it yet. Yeah, they did announce it. Uh, oh, they did? I'll, okay. I'll look for it. Um, well, what do you predict? Uh, that there will be a Google keyboard that does this uh, contextual predictive stuff to make their keyboard a lot faster. Right. Another reason why... Uh, uh, BlackBerry is going to go down the tubes. Whatever yeah, uh, whatever they've developed right now is going to be great for the small number of people that decide that they want to go against the tide of history. Well, there's 80 million users of BlackBerry still, so uh, you know, let's say 10 percent of them buy this BlackBerry 10. That's that's a pretty nice number. It's not numbers that are going to make Apple or uh, Google go hot and bothered. I mean, how many Androids are they uh, registering a day right now? More than a million a day. So, you know, eight, 8 million sold will be eight days worth of Android sold. It, it just doesn't, it's not going to matter. All right. If, uh, if, if you take a SIM card from your current BlackBerry and put it in the 10, will it, will it work? Yeah. I don't know. It no, it will. It's just a phone. I mean, the SIM card, you'll keep the number and everything. As long as it's unlocked, right? Well, the lock is the contract. It's, a, it's artificial. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah. so we're running out of time here. Keith has to drop off, so I'd like to start with him and uh, summarize, change the subject, whatever you want to do uh, since you have to leave. Uh, I guess the only thing I should do is tell you, everyone watching to go to just.me slash get the app and try out our beta because we need it testing. Uh, thank you if you do that, and I think you'll have fun using it. Did you put that in the chat room? The uh, uh, No, I, I haven't. I, I will do. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Keith. Thanks. Thank you. Kevin Marks. Um, I've, I've lost the thread of what we're, what we're, we're, we're talking well, that, about. I that think, may be all right. I think, well, I think the, 
the, this text input thing is 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 indicative. It is one of these things that makes the the Apple platform very annoying. Is that you that you're stuck with um, crappy um, typos and everything you write. Um, I, I find when I use use to type stuff on the iPad, I end up looking stupid because it's not correcting me properly. Whereas on Android, it, it's it's fine and it actually works better than me typing on a keyboard. Robert, do you agree? I too. I do. So you're going to stop using the uh, uh, I didn't, iOS? I, I told you I'm turning in my Apple fanboy T-shirt in this one. Uh, you were probably at the end of February when when the new phones come out. For this reason? Uh, that's a major one. If I can type a lot faster on another platform, that that's a huge amount of what I do. And okay. I, and I'm you know getting the Google glasses. The ecosystem is starting to evolve. How many Everybody. glasses do it at the Crunchies? I don't know. You guys were sitting next to somebody wearing them, right? I, I, was, I, I didn't go. No, Steve, was there. Steve was sitting next to somebody who had, uh, had Tina was sitting next to him. I was sitting next to Tina. Tina so Tina, uh, did he tell you or let you try them? Or? I didn't ask. Ah. <laughs> Such a bad too, journalist. Too shy. <laughs> I just made a point of every time he turned to look this way of staring at him with this like oh, you got Google glasses on expression, <laughs> which is what it'll look like. I mean, you know what the usefulness is of uh, of having you know twenty four hours recorded. I don't know. No, it's not about that. But that, that's okay. You keep thinking it's only about video. It's about it's about a the code name for the team that built these is a uh, wingman. It's about an assistant that helps you live your life, tells you all sorts of stuff, brings news to you, and instead of walking around the town like this, like I see everybody in San Francisco walking around now, uh, you're gonna have that information. It turns you the into classes. the Terminator. Absolutely, I want to be the next Terminator. <laughs> Safe, friendly. <laughs> Make my day. <laughs> I need your pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Kevin Mark's a, yeah, module. Six second Vine uh, promotion for that. What we use. I don't know what that means. We'll but have to cut I'm, that one out and put I'm, it on Vine. Exactly. I, Make a, a ringtone. Kevin Mark's ringtone available for us. <laughs> <laughs> I want your pants. <laughs> Is that the Douglas Adams goat ringtone? <laughs> Good luck explaining it. Kevin. Oh, well. Good luck. Um, all right, John Tashek. Oh, uh, closing remarks. Uh, uh, you know, I think that the, the BlackBerry 10, um, I think that, you know, whoever's under contract with it, you know, may buy them. <laughs> I, I just can't. I, I, it's really hard for me to see them taking market share away from something, except that it may take market share away from the Windows phone. And uh, which doesn't have that much to begin with, and so then you then you're left with two very dominant players and a bunch of smaller ones. Um, so uh, you know there's Nokia and there's is in that mix too. Um, I don't know. Sony still makes phones, but they're on Windows 8. I, I don't know. It, it, it's uh, it, it to me it just doesn't do do as much. It doesn't sound corporate. It sounds like again that they should have come out with their corporate message. And they didn't really do it as much as they could because I I think BlackBerry's core IP is not the phone or the keyboard, but in how it connects uh, in a secure way to the corporation, and um, uh, and then lets people you know do do those things. But that's it. I don't know. Uh, other than that, GitHub is is pretty interesting, and I think the social. A uh, way that that developers are going to develop and and use and reuse components over time is going to be really fantastic, well, and you, I think it deserved to win. John, you brought up something. John, you brought up something interesting when you talked about the uh, secure way of hooking up to the enterprise. Rackspace used to be a BlackBerry shop. You know, everybody used to have a BlackBerry. No, now nobody does because of this thing called bring your own device to work, where people like me bring our iPhones and we're not going to go to a BlackBerry. And so there is no controlling IT infrastructure anymore that can force me to use something. They can buy me another BlackBerry, but it's going to sit in a drawer and somebody's going to pay for it for no reason. Um, 
And I, and I see this over and over again in corporate life that's happened in the United States. Now, there are, there are still a few that are BlackBerry shops. Uh, can Rim hold on to those? That's, a, that's really what this new product was aimed at, was stopping the bleeding. See if they can stop the bleeding of people moving from BlackBerry to, to iPhones and Android phones. Yeah, and but stop if, I, if I ran competitive intelligence for them, I would pick holes in bring your own device as the leading message to the enterprises and get the press interested in that and the right. analysts interested in that because they're, they so do have advantages. Me. Why Apple do has, we need... Apple has chip level encryption, absolutely. Um, and it has a good connection through Active Sync and everything. But, but the BlackBerry actually has a whole server system that's based on this. And what does that server system do when I am putting all of my files on docs and spreadsheets and box.net and uh, Dropbox and other place, you know, other cloud systems. I'm trying to move my entire life to the cloud, not to files. So why do I need the secure system? What, what yeah. does it let me do for, this is, for productivity? Th I mean, John, you, you really sort of hit the nail on the head, I think, when you uh, described the fact, uh, the implications of this for Microsoft are much more significant than they are for whether RIM survives or BlackBerry survives. Uh, you know, the thing that Microsoft is suffering from, among other things, is, is they don't have uh, an aggressive CEO type like uh, Larry Page, uh, as John and Keith pointed out, you know, how uh, effective he's been at taking chances, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they don't have a opportunistic uh, guy like the combination of Gates and Balmer used to be, where they would reach in and crush uh, a weaker competitor at the very moment when it would accelerate the inevitability of the Windows platform. They they don't seem to have somebody. I mean, what they instead of going after Nokia, which was sort of the right idea, they should have gone after BlackBerry. They should have bought them. And they should have uh, grabbed those 80 million users while they had them and moved them over instead of letting them, uh, you know, wallow in their situation, them meaning BlackBerry, uh, with QNX, etc. Uh, they haven't had uh, a real sense of the imperative of being able to coalesce the market down to the number of smaller companies that are left that could make a difference in terms of Microsoft's situation. So I think this is a huge loss for Microsoft for the reasons that John suggests and because, you know, bring your own device is not about the device. It's about the app store that's behind it. The reason that you want to, you know, have your iPhone there is because all your apps are on there. And, you know, that is not going to slow down once it's inside the corporate you know firewall uh it is going to figure out how to be able to do it good enough on at least those two platforms to be able to make uh, the relevance of uh of uh, blackberry irrelevant so i think it's a big big week uh, another big week for microsoft losses i mean the, this story by, what was the guy's name uh, that you pinged? Uh, oh, Preston Grala? Right. I mean, this, that, this story uh, a year ago would have been mind-numbing in its significance. It's like that story a couple of years ago where some analyst uh, uh, reduced uh, the recommendation on Microsoft from uh, buy to uh, neutral and then to sell. I mean, you know, some of us who've been around for a while look at this and go, are you kidding me? And this, this article about Surface and its implications for uh, you know, uh, Windows 8 and Windows RT, it's mind-numbingly bad for, for Microsoft. I mean, they failed, according to this article. And I haven't seen any credible response to it. The, un the other thing I want to mention, uh, and I haven't got the URL in front of me, but there was this... Uh, on Mashable of all places, and this was uh, uh, shared by J.P. Rangaswamy. Did you see this uh, note, Kevin, of uh, uh, the 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 boy, the eight-year-old boy, 
uh, coming up with a reason why he couldn't keep going out with his girlfriend. Yeah, it's classic if you can find it. I'll try and find it and put it in the chat room. The basic uh, rationale was is that if it comes down to a choice between you and fried chicken, you lose. <laughs> Frazier says she says something like, she says, uh, well, you know, I need somebody who can, uh, you know, laugh with me when I'm happy and be with me when I'm sad. And, and the guy says, well, <laughs> all you know, I'm the, I'm your guy except for. If it's, it's a choice between you and fried chicken, <laughs> if I'm hungry and there's fried chicken, see ya. <laughs> so I think that the fried chicken uh, uh, quotient uh, for Microsoft, they're in deep trouble. I think it's it's if it's fried chicken or Microsoft, it's going to be fried chicken. This is Steve Gilmore. This has been the Gilmore Gang. I want to thank uh, uh, Rackspace and particularly Rob Lejess, uh, without which this show would not be here. I want to thank uh, uh, New Tech and their TriCaster. I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. I want to thank Keith Tier, who's uh, off on another call, uh, but glad he's back and hope to see him again soon. <laughs> I want to thank Kevin Marks. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, Robert Scoble, as always. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, you're traveling next week, right? Uh, yeah, going to Sun Valley to hang out with some geeks and go skiing. All right, well, we'll see what we can do about that. And uh, John Tashek, as always, incredible, bringing the Enterprise into focus at the last possible second. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a uh, football game this weekend. Where? Is anyone making predictions? Uh yeah, 49ers. Go I Niners. Think, I think they fit. I think they're uh, favored by three. Go, go, four nine ers. That's right, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks in the chat room. Appreciate it as always. Uh, <coughs> thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time. Bye bye. Thanks.